and, and that is uh, a generic throughout all of these situations and, and, and independent of, of whether there's a, a higher being that's the, that's the, the, the object of that, of that feeling. That's right. So the phenomenology is, is a similar human emotion. That's right. And there's a whole story about whether perhaps this highest being is uh, the, the, the supreme being. That was the term I was looking for. Yeah. The, whether, whether the supreme being isn't a kind of problem because it sort of takes your, an unconditional commitment to the supreme being, gets rid of the importance of temporality, gets rid of the risk, gets rid of it. Kierkegaard's got a lot to say about how the commitment has to be for something finite and temporal. And Jesus is finite and temporal. And then that means you have a tremendous risk because the commitment is vulnerable. Martin Luther King yeah. might have failed. Nobody might have turned out for the peace marches. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Luther might have been grabbed by the Inquisition. I think maybe that's a kind of... got the years wrong, maybe. <laughs> but anyway, not made it to start a new religion. Mm -hmm. So, And it's absolutely essential, for, from the way Kierkegaard sees it, that in order to get your life together in this meaningful way, you also have to be able to accept the risk. And, of course, love is another example. Is, is risk critical, to, Absolutely the, to, to, critical. To, the, to the nature of the commitment? That because it's temporal. And see, you, I, as I say to my classes, it's not a, you can't be committed to, say, the eventual triumph of the proletariat because you can't lose on that one. You, <laughs> even if you die, they're going to go on and triumph eventually. <laughs> and that's not, a, un, that's not a Kierkegaardian, not a Judeo-Christian unconditional commitment. All their commitments were to actually do something. I mean, take the people to the promised land. I mean, like, like Martin Luther King, uh, Moses didn't quite make it, but he saw the promised land and he did his job. And he could have failed. It's, and, but in Kierkegaard talk, our, the human self, well, this is a long story, but an important one. I mean, the, the self before this Judeo-Christian story had two parts, the eternal mental part and the body temporal part. And different people in, in Greece where they were thinking about this took different sides on which was the essential part. Mm -hmm. So Plato thought you should dump the body, right, it's, only the, right. it's only the tomb of the soul, right. and merge with the eternal part. Never mind the temporal. And the, but Lucretius and the materialists said, no, the, 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 that, that's all superstition, all that religious stuff about the eternal. Yeah. Would well, you stick with the material body you've got and that's all you've got? Uh, and they, they were separable and, and you had to decide which was essential. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Kierkegaard says, that's not the way the self is. Then now we've got to bring in Pascal. Pascal is the first to have seen or claimed that the self is essentially body and soul and you can't get rid of either and the more you have of one the more if you get in the right relation the more you have of one the more you have of the other that's closer to the original biblical tradition i think i think so too I and mean, plato got in there and sort of undermined right. the judeo-christian tradition right. and by both, the way of the christian and both judaism and christianity followed a great deal of hellenistic and exactly and, 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 the and, Greek and world. pascal says that uh, we are both body and uh, soul and that we have to be stretched sort of he has a picture of us kind of crucified on you have to be stretched the greater the person the more they are stretched to both extremes mm. I think of him I bet he's imagining them on the cross but the point is the the more you can express the now but body and soul is a bad term now we have to get rid of it uh, because of this idea that they're just a combination and you can have one rather than the other Whereas, now we get to Kierkegaard, about 1850. Kierkegaard's the one who's understood all this and says, no, it's a synthesis. And it's not good to talk about body and soul because they lead you to think that there's a, you can get rid of one or the other. But it's a synthesis, and then he has his own terms of the temporal, that's what we've been talking about, risky in time, mm -hmm. and the eternal, where the eternal now means some meaning of this which stays constant no matter what happens in time. So your love goes on and adapts, but it, it has to go on in a way that it's... You got this, once you get, in Kierkegaard language, a definition of yourself, which is your unconditional, so I'm the follower of Jesus or I'm the lover of Beatrice, mm -hmm. then that's eternal in the only important sense of eternal phenomenology again. Never mind whether there's an eternal up there. <laughs> there's something in your life which is not up for grabs. Uh, most things in your life, you change 
if you, they could change and change. Uh, Sartre has this interesting story of somebody who has a religious, what they take to be, a, uh, they have an adolescent crisis. They take it to be a religious experience. They go into the monastery. After 20 years, they realize that it was an adolescent experience, and they go out into the world, and in, they're in business. On the deathbed, they think again, no, no, I really betrayed it. That was a religious experience, and they <laughs> repent. And Sartre's point is, you just there's nothing stable about these defining commitments. They can change, and the, when the, and the where you happen to be when you die is just arbitrary. Well, that means Sartre just denies what Kierkegaard calls the eternal. The eternal is when you get into the relation to the eternal, you don't flip around anymore. You know, this is the woman, or this is my job in the world. But, okay, when that means you've got to satisfy both the temporal and the eternal parts of the self, only they are not a combination, but a synthesis, because if you do it right, like Dante loving Beatrice, the more eternal you've got, the more temporal meaning you've got. And the more temporal meaning you've got, the more it's steady and eternal. So this is how phenomenology gives a radically different approach to religion than does analytical philosophy. Yes, but the uh, phenomenology starting with the experience, in this case, the experience of having an unconditional commitment or a calling, describing that gives you a whole different understanding of the self, gives you a whole understanding of the, the whole Judeo-Christian tradition. We didn't Chris emphasize Brand, it, but it makes direction, Jesus, the God-man, the center, God the Father, the, the uh, almighty uh, supreme being, that, that was, which was infiltrated so much by Greek philosophy, doesn't become important anymore. What becomes important is life in the temporal, in the finite, and yet having a life that has meaning. That's what phenomenologists can talk about.